So guys, we kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit really quick before we get into the episode about this amazing new thing that Laura and I have found, and it's called Magic Mind. It's an energy shot drink that is way different from the usual energy shot drinks that you find in your local stores that are just chock full of chemicals and massive caffeine that maybe get you through your day for a couple of hours and then leave you in a major crash after they wear off. Also, they taste pretty gross. And this one is actually pretty freaking amazing. So Laura and I tried it when we went to Trans Allegheny. We got up early in the morning and we drove from Pittsburgh to Weston. And then we went on a tour. We did all kinds of fun stuff. And then that night we did an eight hour overnight investigation of the lunatic asylum. And before we did that, we took a shot of this Magic Mind all-natural energy drink. And Laura, I don't know about you, but I really thought it was kind of fucking amazing. Honestly, it was really great because instead of getting that crash that you get with the caffeine, like I was able to go all night and I didn't get that dip, you know, where you had to go back and drink another monster or right. coffee. Right. I was, yeah, I was good to go for the entire vest- investigation and my focus was on it was great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it that's super important because that night there were there they had coffee a coffee station for us. I mean, we had cannolis, we had cookies, there was like all <laughs> kinds of sugar there, and we didn't need any of it. I don't think I actually ate any of it. We didn't need it. It was but, amazing. Yeah. And it's because it's not chock full of caffeine, like you said. They mm. use L theanine which instead of it works better than caffeine it gives you the energy but without the crash right so you get to keep going right and it doesn't give you those like jitters that like five hour energy drinks that you get at the grocery store or whatever give you where you're kind of like this does not have that um so i really um i really really enjoy it i really do recommend it it is all natural ingredients guys and look i have a subscription look it comes in this amazing little box and it's all these cute little bottles look at that look at that can you see it yes so yes so cute. And the nice thing is that they're easy, that they're little and easy to take with you, which is an added bonus if you're on a ghost investigation. And <laughs> a thousand purses. Yeah, we're not taking a bunch of big bags and purses with us on an investigation. Also comes with this sure. really handy little brochure, gives you all of the like ideas behind it and the benefits and different recipes. Um, it does have matcha in it, which is for me anyway an acquired taste but the great thing is this company also is like hey if that taste of matcha is too strong here's some recipes we've got some ideas for you put it in iced coffee put it in steamed milk add it to a smoothie i mean it's there's it's endless possibilities and it doesn't taste gross like some of these other ones do i really really do like it and i absolutely stand behind it and i highly recommend it to all of you guys Right, and for the next 10 days, you can get 40% off um, a subscription at www.magicmind.co backslash H-O-A-H. And um, if you just want to try it one time uh, with the discount code H-O-A-H-20, you can get 20% off a one-time order as well. Yeah, which is really amazing. I think this is a really wonderful promotion for all of our amazing listeners. So please, please, please come check it out. One-time purchase, you get 20% off. Discount code is H-O-A-H-20. And if you want to subscribe, which I highly recommend that you do, for the next 10 days, like Laura said, you can get 40% off your subscription at www.magicmind.co slash H-O-A-H. And now let's talk about some ghosts.
Hey, hey. Hey, hey, what's, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening, hot stuff? <laughs> I love that movie so much. <laughs> Do you know that yeah. what movie that is? Or did you? is no, it I just can... something that's stuck in your head? It's just something that's stuck in my head. What is it oh from? Oh, my God. It's from 16 Candles. Ah, uh, thank you. Long there Duck you Dong. What's the happening, uh, hot stuff? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God, like the most racist thing ever. Good. I'm so glad I'm bringing that to the show. I, I'm glad that's stuck in your head. Way to go. Um, no, yeah, that's, yeah, it's it's a pretty famous line from 16 Candles. So. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Uh, which is wow. the best movie in I Heart Jake Ryan forever. Um, <laughs> hi, welcome back to a brand new episode of History of a Haunting, where we are already uh, starting to talk about a bunch of nonsense <laughs> after we talked about uh, the wonderful little thing that we discovered called Magic Mind. So, guys, check that out. We told you all about how to get it, and now we're going to get into the show. Um, we do have EVPs. Hold on, let me find my button. I'm not really sure how I forget how all this works. It's been it's we're it's hit, been a minute. It's been a minute and we're not recording consistently. Um we are going to start now, but bef- it's we've had some breaks. So <laughs> EVPs, as we like to call them, endless vocal prattling, where we give you the um, late breaking news happening with the podcast and its hosts. Laura, you start. Um, I, I don't know. What are we talking about? I know. It slipped my it's, mind, too. That's why I was like, you go. I was like, um, we're going to be doing the Trans-Allegheny <laughs> Uh, recap episode coming up here. We're getting everything together, pulling all the evidence so yes. that we can give it all to you guys. And yeah. we're going to bring on some of the investigators we had with us mm-hmm. so you guys can get introduced to them. And they are really awesome. Tons of experience. Oh, really God. great people to learn from. Yeah. A thousand yeah and we have, we, I mean, the captures are awesome I think the ones that we're getting sent yeah the ones that we've we found so far are pretty great the ones that folks that because we went with what was it four other teams mm-hmm. um, there were like 20 investigators total so there's, mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of us out there there was a lot of us yeah so um the other teams were all still working on getting through all of the evidence but what we've got so far from even the other teams is pretty phenomenal um, we did talk to you about it a little bit in the, um, not last week's episode, we re- we re-released Oriental Theater last week, because uh, I was out of town, and, um, but uh, on our episode back, <laughs> and then we were like, eh, hey, we're, we're off again, uh, <laughs> but the episode on, on June 4th, Edgar Allan Poe, we did talk about it at length, the crazy capture that our team, Southern Entities Paranormal, captured uh, at Trans-Allegheny. We're going to be showing that to you, too. So far, that is the reigning piece of evidence as far as creep factor. Um, But like I said to Chris, I was like, so far, you're the king with the creepy capture of Trans-Allegheny that night. Uh, But we still have more teams to send in their evidence. And I think... Yeah, I think Anthony has number two. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's good stuff coming in. So. Such good stuff coming in. Such good stuff coming in. Um, so we're going to showcase all of the best of everybody's um, evidence, except for ours. We're going to show you some pretty good stuff. But then, you know, the Patreons, eventually, one day when I get my freaking shit together, we'll get all of the Trans-Allegheny evidence in one episode. I was gonna, I've been working on the first Trans-Allegheny one, and then I'm like, well, fucking why? Because, like, now we've been back, and I've got more, so I might as well just mush it all together in one giant Trans-Allegheny evidence reveal episode for the Patreon, so... I'm working on that, but it is, it is, uh, you know, it, it takes a minute to, to get all that, you know, put together in some sort of cohesive, stylistic, cool video. Um, I don't know. Anyway, you guys are very patient and I love you. Thank you for <laughs> your patience. Um, so yeah, Trans Allegheny, that's something we definitely wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, and then, uh, there was something else. Uh, you guys can catch us on World of Awakening last Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Andrea, Andrea Parent Take show. a step back um, in time. Uh, step back in time. But it's still available. You can go to the YouTube, watch it, mm-hmm. Facebook. Yeah. Um, go check it out if you missed yeah. us. 
terribly. Yes. And you want to see. Most, and you want to see. Yes. Mostly me. Mostly Laura. It was um, basically the Laura show. Um, it was. It aired June 10th, Friday, June 10th. And I was, um, Koi and I were in Pittsburgh because my beautiful niece, Emma, graduated from high school. And so we were there. And so... Um, they asked us to be on Andrea's show, A World Awakening, and I said, yeah, we we would love to be, I think. I have a thing, but let's see if Laura is, is happy with, you know, going on by herself. And she wasn't at first, but she warmed up to it. Like, <laughs> it, was, it, it was Laura's first <clears throat> outing by herself promoting the podcast, and you guys, she kicked ass. Who surprised? Well, and I'm not, not used me. to being able to talk that much at one clip, so I had to... Jump. Listen, I don't want to, like, step over her toes, but, like, I'm telling you right now, Laura did that fucking amazing job, and listen to me talk about how great Laura was. <laughs> Sorry. And, no. uh, Aaron, our host, uh, who was filling in for Andrea, is amazing and lovely, and she does just a fantastic job, and so <sighs> we love Aaron here. So, yeah. Thanks, Aaron. We thank absolutely for do. For having us on. Yeah, we love Aaron here, and it's... Um, uh, I jump in in the last 30 minutes of the show, um, you know, to wrap it up like only I know how. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I, I was able to... I mean, to, pretty much. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to, to join in the last 30 minutes of the show, but basically it is the Laura show. So you guys check it out sincerely. Um, and like Laura said, uh, Aaron is a really wonderful um, human being and delicious friend of ours. We adore her. Uh, and uh, there, I think you guys talked about it, it, at one point in the show about how neither one of you can really believe the fortune that the for the fortunate tour or turn your lives have taken in this paranormal road. And the people that you've gotten to meet and the experiences that you've gotten to have. And I utterly share that with both of you. You guys are um, have really made this entire journey even that much more spectacular for me as well. So um, I really resonated oh, with that you. when when you guys talked about that. I was like, absolutely. I was like, watching you on my big TV <laughs> when I took that picture and, pr and posted it on all the social media. I was like, yes, exactly that. Like, how is this my life? Um yeah, I think that that's true too. Um, for other people that we've met and we've been able to partner with, and um, go on these great investigations, these are bucket list places um, with amazing people who are yeah. just really cool people to be around. They're fun to hang out with. They're fun to investigate with. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we talk about and we deal with are, is very heavy, but we have a good time too. So you know, there's yeah. levity. Everybody you know, is quick with a joke, quick for a laugh, and also, you know, still takes what they do seriously. And I yeah. just love it. It's been really great. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, nothing I ever saw myself doing if you would ask me a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, it's, it's certainly an interesting road. And we have found ourselves <laughs> in some crazy places. But the company that we keep in those places is... Um, is priceless and and that's mm, that's notch. kind of yeah yeah that's kind of the best part of it that and you know the evidence captures that's pretty cool too and then the unexplainable like things that we experience is is mm -hmm. kind of heart racy in such a good way um yeah so plus we get to see these historic places like yes. in person and walk yes. you know where all this stuff crazy stuff happened and just that in and of itself is is mind-blowing just to see them in real life yeah and, and to, be there and yeah to be able to actually explore them go to these places that we talk mm -hmm. about all the time yeah. um there's that's the um, the um magnitude of of the um fortune that is on laura and i is not lost on us that we we can do this so absolutely not yeah and thank you to our listeners because you guys make it um possible for pushing us out there to go do this more and more and we appreciate it yeah for sure for sure um i did want to also mention did i say it did you say it did we say it at all um <clears throat> back to the trans allegheny the the lie the recap episode we've got um the two guests you did mention that but did we say that we were going to do it live on facebook we're going to record it live on facebook 
Did we no, say that? No, but you just no. did. So okay. Yeah. Guys, we you are going to do yet. that. We don't have a date yet. And as soon as we're we have a date, it. we're going to create an event on Facebook. We're going to let all of you guys know. Um, but right now, we don't have a date, but we are going to do it live on Facebook because... And Laura and I talked about this kind of at length today, a little bit longer than we should have, but that's just how we roll. Check out this segment <laughs> on the show right now. Um, <laughs> we talked about it um, quite a bit today as to should we do it live. And the reason we chose to do it live is because we're having two um, team members that we investigated Trans Allegheny with Anthony Simonelli and uh, Giuseppe Joe Cardona is go- they're going to be our guests on the show, but we also have all of the folks from Piedmont Paranormal and Spirits of the Southeast and the rest of um, what is our team name? I'm kidding, Chris. Southern Entities Paranormal <laughs> <laughs> um, that that aren't are going to be hosting it with us like this where you can see our shining faces on camera um but we want to be able to have them watching and in the chat so if you guys have questions about the evidence that they have sent us that we're going to show you you can ask them and they will be there to be able to answer your questions and be able to be part of the discussion as well in the chat so we're going to do that live uh on facebook um at blah blah time on blah blah date coming soon Right. To be announced. To be announced. Um, the next thing that I do want to mention, which is a huge, huge deal for this podcast, for Laura and I, is... Are you ready? Are you ready? Drum Here roll. we go. It's a big announcement, guys. It's big announcement time. <sighs> That's my drum roll. Is that dumb? Okay. That was good. Do it. Was it good? Okay, good, good, good. good. Here's the big announcement. We're going to be booked at a convention! Yay! (laughs) Yes, ladies and gentlemen, History of a Haunting will be special VIP guests at SpiritCon May 19th through the 20th, 2023 in St. Augustine, Florida. So come see us. It is a paranormal convention. We are very, very excited about this. It is going, the festivities start on Friday. They go through Sunday. Um, Friday night, there is going to be uh, a paranormal investigation of the Jimenez Facio house um, with your host, Karen Tatro. She is a spirit medium. She is a paranormal host and an author. Along with Dustin Perry from Ghost Hunters. Laura, do you remember him? I loved I Dustin. Yes. <laughs> right? He was the best. And then our friend, our very dear friend, who we are very honored to call our now personal friend, Andrea Perrin of The Conjuring House. She is an author. She is a speaker. She is a healer. She is an activist. She is a UFOologist. And she is absolutely one of the most amazing humans on the fucking planet. So they are your hosts. And um, the second night on Saturday, we're going to be doing a investigation of the St. Augustine Lighthouse. Which, if you guys saw that episode of Ghost Hunters, it aired in 2006. I think it's like season one, maybe early season two. Damn, this place was nuts. We did cover it in episode... (laughs) And so check that out um, because the actual episode name escapes me. But yes, History of a Haunting special VIP guest will be at our first Paracon, Spirit Con, May 19th through the 20th, 2023 in St. Augustine, Florida. And I could not be more fucking excited um you're gonna be hearing a lot about this guys because i'm not gonna shut up about it ever i mean ever it's it's only you guys only have like you know 11 more months to hear about it so weekly (laughs) Mm -hmm. um there also hopefully will be a few more announcements like that one to come yes yeah and why would that be carrie um that would be because laura made the grand mistake of coming up with a brilliant idea and telling me about it and that brilliant idea is we're writing a book Ah. fish (laughs) well i'm right yeah yeah. we're writing a book (laughs) ish we are we are writing a book you guys oh my god it was laura's brainchild so i'm gonna let her tell you the the details about it and give you all the hot gosses to like what the book is about but 
Yes, Laura and I are writing a book. And um, that's kind of one of the reasons why we're starting to book appearances at conventions so that we can hawk our wares at them. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, God so, willing, if it gets published in time. Right. So, yeah. I mean, the gist of the book is basically, it's a lot like a podcast. We're going to talk about the history and hauntings of our favorite locations. Uh, we're also going to give you guys some photographic evidence to go along with that and pictures of the places that we talk about. Um and these are all places that we have personally investigated. So we have, um, you know, firsthand knowledge that we're going to be sharing with you guys about these places. Yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. I'm excited for it. We're working on it. Yeah, I'm excited for it as well. Um, we have narrowed down our top 12. It's actually going to be a top 10 book. So it's our top 10 locations. Um, we have narrowed down our top 12. Uh, cause you know, you know, things happen. It's certainly, we're certainly well aware of that as, um, podcasters and content creators where we have planned out a list of episodes and then something happens and a, an episode gets bumped for another episode as we go through the, the research of it. And so it's going to be kind of, kind of that way. So we have our top 12 locations that we've actually been to. We actually have photographs of and, um, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, you will notice my office behind me. I have photographs uh, behind me. They are all of locations that we have been to. I'm going to kind of tilt my camera so you guys can see. I mean, my mixed style collection is really kind of banana sandwich. Um, but all of these pictures here are all photographs of haunted locations that we have actually been to. And some of these might actually make it into the book. Um, but just to kind of give you guys an idea of of how much photography we have <laughs> um, of the places Carrie's that we super annoying. She takes to. a lot of pictures. I take a ton of pictures and Laura can't stand it. And then takes the worst ones of me and puts them on the internet. <laughs> this is like... Earth Look, earth I earth cannot earth help earth that earth. it rained I'm at... Like, I have seven chins in that one. Can we maybe use another one? And then your, your response is always, but I look cute. I look so good. <laughs> Um, well, also, it wasn't my fault that it rained in West Virginia the day we investigated Old Hospital on College Hill, mm. and your hair was frizzy. That was yeah, a good picture of us, but then you were like, look at it, like, all the frizz. I can't believe you posted oh that. Oh, my God. It looks, my hair is literally, like, a Q-tip, <laughs> and it was pulled back, too, and it was just, like, it was so Those, bad. like, tiny little hairs <laughs> in the front were, like, whoo. Um, Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Case in point. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. There's that. I mean, it happens. Right. I it's a we, thing. So we that's hit. we hit all of the the high notes. We Trans Allegheny right. recap the book. Uh, we're going to Spirit Con. Um, we're going to Spirit Con. We're going to a Spirit Con. Yeah, we're going to do that. And I think I need it. I need, I think I need a sip of Magic Mind to get through this episode <laughs> because guys. Let's get into the episode. Laura, tell them who we're talking about today. Today, we are going to talk about Barney and Betty Hill. Yes, and it is an abduction story. Um, before we get into the sources, I did want to say that we did cover the abduction of Travis Walton, and we got one comment, one comment. In all the people that watched it, in all the people that listened to it, we got one comment, and I don't remember the person's name, but they said, um, this story, the abduction of Travis Walton, this story was actually way more um, entertaining and interesting than you guys made it out to be. So... <laughs> I remembered that and not that it matters because it was just one of you. Um, but I did remember that when I, cause I wrote this week's script and I did remember that when I wrote it. So I certainly do hope that we, um, that I give Barney and Betty Hill a little more justice than I gave Travis Walton. And I certainly will be talking about him, uh, in my half of, the episode. So, Laura, why don't you go ahead and let them know what my sources or our sources were for this episode. All right. Sources for this episode are History.com, Wikipedia.com, and NewsCenterMaine.com. 
Yes. And uh, if you use wikipedia.com for anything, even if it's just to find out crazy information about whatever, please consider giving them a donation because um, they they need us as much as we need them. And it's not just for podcasters. It's for students and for, you know, just nosy <laughs> people that want to know about like whatever the fuck that Wikipedia has. And they have everything. Wikipedia. They're almost it's better than the people. <laughs> they're almost better than Google. <laughs> so anyway. All right. All right, Laura, take it away. Let's talk about the abduction right. of Barney and Betty Hill. I really like this story. It was a good one. Yeah, let's do it. So is it chasing us? That thought coursed through Betty and Barney Hill's minds as they drove down the empty winding country road in New Hampshire's White Mountains. It was a September night in 1961, and they hadn't seen a car for miles and a strange light in the sky seemed to follow them. When they finally got home to Portsmouth at dawn, they were far from relieved. They felt dirty. Their watches had stopped working. Barney's shoes were, shoes were strangely scuffed and Betty's dress was ripped. Um, there was two hours of the drive that neither of them could remember uh, what had happened. With the help of a psychiatrist, uh, the quiet couple eventually revealed a startling story. Gray beings with large eyes had walked them into a metallic disc as wide, Betty said, as her house was long. That's fucking Once huge. Once inside, yeah, that's A house big. is long. Like, that's huge. <laughs> mm-hmm. Once inside, the beings examined the couple and erased their memories. Their experience would kick off an Air Force inquiry, part of the secretive initiative Project Blue Book, that investigated UFO sightings across the country. Um, and you know, the Pentagon did this too, starting back like in the fifties, I think they started doing it. Oh, too. really? Have you heard of project uh, blue book? I'd never heard of it. No, but the, I know that I forget the name of the Pentagon one, but yeah, the Pentagon had one too. Okay. Um, the incident would also become the first ever widely publicized alien abduction account and shape how stories like it were told and understood from then on. Debate continues as to whether the husband and wife were liars fantasists, crackpots, or simply sleep-deprived people who later recovered seriously scrambled memories. I mean, I might fall into that final category. Right. Seriously (laughs) sleep-deprived. That's how I live. I mean... That's my default setting. A thousand percent, thank God for Magic Mm -hmm. Mind. (laughs) I'm not even kidding. (laughs) So the Hills lived in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, Barney, who was born in 1922... Um, and passed in 1969, was employed by the U.S. Postal Service. While Betty, um, also known as Eunice Barrett, uh, and she was born in 1919. Look at her. She's a cougar. And she didn't pass until 2004. She was a social worker. She's a cougar. (laughs) He's three years younger. I mean, yeah, but still. (laughs) (laughs) Active in the local Unitarian uh, congregation, the Hills were also members of the NAACP and community leaders. Uh, Barney sat on a local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. They were an interracial couple um, at a time when it was particularly uncommon in the United States. Barney was black and Betty was white. In a lot of the country, it was also illegal still. Yes. And no Uh, Betty White jokes, please, guys. Right. Even though (laughs) I just apparently made one. Right, there you go. <laughs> I mean, no more just the jokes. One. Just the one. <laughs> just the, one. <laughs> um, the Hills Road Trip was spontaneous. Um, a well-earned break Barney decided the couple needed. Um, as explained in The Interrupted Journey, a 1966 book um, that they collaborated on with author John G. Fuller, Barney working worked a grueling night shift at the post office um, and drove 60 miles each way. Nope. That's- garbage Mm -hmm. that's utter (laughs) garbage yeah dear god (laughs) i mean today do you know how much that would cost like nine (laughs) hundred (laughs) dollars so betty's job handling state child welfare cases um was no picnic either oh jesus they both had the suckiest jobs ever right so the little free time that the couple had um they devoted to their church and activities related to the civil rights movement they basically cool. sound like saints. Cool. Um, yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. yeah. So after 16 months of marriage, Betty and Barney saw this trip through Montreal and Niagara Falls as their delayed honeymoon. Neat. I they like left- it. I know. Cute, right? I'm here for so this. They yeah. So <laughs> impulsively that they had no time to go to the bank before it closed for the weekend. They got in their car with less than 70 bucks in their pockets. 
Yikes. I mean, but I, it, I mean, that seems like okay. That seems kind of okay for what, 63, 4, 5 in yeah. the 60s? 60s. Oh, but maybe they couldn't go to another bank. I mean, I guess they didn't. I don't know how that worked. I don't know. There's That's no weird. like ATMs on every corner. I mean, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like just moving it into your debit, your other account <laughs> <laughs> on your app. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So on the last night of their three day trip, <clears throat> Uh, the tired couple sipped coffee in a Vermont diner to recharge before they drove back. Uh, Barney figured that if they pushed through, they could beat the wind and rains from an approaching hurricane. <laughs> they left the diner around 10 p.m., estimating that they could reach their red-framed house in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, between 2 and 3 a.m. at the latest. Sounds fair. I mean, that sounds like stuff that we do all the time. I, right. Um, <laughs> we leave now. We mm-hmm. can get there by, yeah, a thousand percent. Mm-hmm. So as they drove, strange light in the sky gave another reason to hurry. Um, At first, it looked like a falling star, but grew larger and brighter with each mile. Uh, Barney was an avid plane watcher and a World War II vet. Mm. um, And he was sure that there was nothing to worry about. Um, He said it was just a satellite um, and it probably went off course. Which, okay. Okay. I mean, fair. Mm -hmm. Uh, The light seemed to move with the car as Barney steered down the curving mountain road. The light zigged and zagged, ducking past the moon and behind trees and mountain ridges, only to reappear moments later. Sometimes it seemed to, seemed to move toward them in a game of cat and mouse. Um, and they thought it had to be an illusion. Sure. Yeah. Which is probably what I would think, too. Um, me, like, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, this is an optical illusion. I'm really tired. It's three o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's dark. It's rainy, wind, like a whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're in the mountains. Yeah. Limited visibility. Okay. Um, and they, yeah, they thought like the car's movement made it like seem like the light was moving as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So curiosity overcame them eventually and the couple pulled over at road stops and picnic turnouts to get a closer look. Through binoculars, Betty saw that the white light was really an object spinning in the air. Barney, she told her husband, if you think that's a satellite or a star, you're being completely ridiculous. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. He knew she was right. Barney had an IQ of 140. Wow. Uh, Barney was also a pragmatic man who wouldn't give flying saucers a second thought. Um, remembered his niece Kathleen Mar- Kathleen Martin in her own work captured the Betty and Barney Hill experience. So the night was too quiet for a helicopter, a commercial plane, or even military jet with a hotshot pilot. He didn't want to spook Betty, but he was becoming concerned. Um, so what was the light and why was it like fucking with them? Yes. Um, about 70 miles past the diner, the object just hovered above the treetops about 100 feet above them. Uh, so Barney abruptly stopped the car and he kept the engine running. He shoved a handgun he'd hidden beneath the seat into his pocket and rushed into a dark field, leaving Betty in the car. Oh my God! This leave. no, no, <laughs> not a dark field. No, this sounds like so many '80s horror slasher flick intros. This sounds like what not to do. <laughs> yes, it okay. also sounds like the start of a my favorite murder episode. <laughs> like <laughs> kind of yes. Mm-mm, don't dear God. Okay. So what he saw was as big as a jet, but as round and flat as a pancake. Um, My God, what is this thing? He recalled thinking, this can't be real. So behind rows of windows, gray uniformed beings seemed to look right at him. He tried to lift his hand to his pistol, but somehow he couldn't. Um, A voice told him not to put down his binoculars. He had a startling thought, we're about to be captured. (laughs) <laughs> Yelling hysterically, he ran back to the car and barreled down the road as Betty tracked the craft, craning her head outside the car window. <laughs> that would be us. <laughs> right? Like, Where is it at? <laughs> <laughs> we deserve we to be. Been like, take us. Right? I'm here for you. Don't suck me up by my chest plate. I'm just <laughs> throw down a rope ladder. That's right. what Dane Cook says. You don't need to do that. <laughs> Don't suck me up on my chest plate. <laughs> so, um, okay. So without explanation, loud rhythmic beeps sounded from the car's trunk. Um, and so the couple instantly felt drowsy and lost consciousness. 
Uh, they came to around two hours later and 35 miles down the road. Holy shit. All right. So back home in Portsmouth, they tried to make sense of their night. Um, Barney felt compelled to examine his body's lower half. Both seemed to be aware of a puzzling presence. Hmm. In the weeks and months after, Betty, an avid reader, checked out books from the library discovering the civilian UFO group National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, uh, NICAP. So, NICAP or <laughs> N-I-C-A-P. Like, no, no. NICAP. Oh, NICAP. NICAP. Not, NICAP. Not, not, okay, sorry. <laughs> I mean, they probably needed a fucking NICAP, but NICAP. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're all going to need one after this story. And we might. I know how it ends. You do? Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, all right then. Wait I just said I wrote all of it. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. on September 21st, Betty telephoned the Peace Air Force Base to report their UFO encounter. Though for fear of being labeled eccentric, she withheld some of the details. Fair. On September 22nd, right? I wouldn't fucking no, tell anybody. No. <laughs> um, Major Paul W. Henderson telephoned the Hills for a more detailed interview. Henderson's report dated September 26th determined that the Hills had probably misidentified the planet Jupiter. Uh, this was later changed to optical condition, inversion, and insufficient data. Uh, report 100-1-61 Air Intelligence Information Record. His report was forwarded to Project Blue Book, the U.S. Air Force UFO Research Project. So within That really days, didn't exist officially. Right. Okay. Mm-mm. Right. It sounds like the men in black, basically. So within days of the encounter, Betty borrowed a UFO book from a local library. It had been written by retired Marine Corps uh, Major Donald E. Kehoe, who was also the head of NICAP, the Civilian UFO Research Group. Cheers. So, oh, um, right. Every time you say NICAP, I'm going to be like, woohoo! <laughs> All right. So on September 26, Betty wrote to Kehoe, She related the full story, including the details about the humanoid figures that Barney had observed through binoculars. Um, Betty wrote that she and Barney were considering hypnosis to recall what had happened. Uh, Her letter was eventually passed on to Walter N. Webb, a Boston astronomer and NICAP member. Drink! (laughs) So Webb met with the Hills on October 21st, 1961. And in a six-hour interview, the Hills related all they could remember of the UFO encounter. Six uh, hours? Like, Jesus. Okay. Right? Seriously. You were whining uh, Barney- about two-hour interview. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. Um, Bart, I'm like, how can people talk that much? I mean, if I had been abducted by a UFO, I probably could talk for fucking six hours. I mean, you did talk for two straight hours until like mm-hmm. I jumped in and then was like, listen, I'll take it from here. I got this. Hey. I got this. You've talked oh way God. too long. <laughs> yeah. Hold my nightcap. Hold my nightcap. <laughs> Go on. So Barney asserted that he had developed like a mental block um, and that he suspected that there were some portions of the event that he did not want to remember. Fair. Um, he described in detail all that he could remember about the craft and the appearance of the somehow not human figures aboard the craft. Webb stated that they were telling the truth and the incident probably occurred exactly as reported, except for some minor uncertainties and technicalities that must be tolerated in any such observations where human judgment is involved. Fair. That's fair. For example, like exact time, length of visibility, you know, the sizes of the object and the occupants, distance and height, etc. Well, I mean, and that's, that's like witnesses to a crime. Like, that's why mm -hmm. they want to get their statement right away. And then even over time, as the trial progresses, witnesses, people forget, Mm -hmm. you know, they forget the exact situation and the exact details. Like, so that's, that's fair. Plus your mind will fill in stuff if you're missing certain things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff that it doesn't, that it doesn't find relevant. It will fill in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, information. So. Yeah. So, 10 days after the alleged UFO encounter, and Betty began having a series of vivid dreams. Uh, they continued for five successive nights. Never in her memory had she recalled dreams in such detail and intensity. Hmm. But they stopped abruptly after five nights and they never came back. That's weird. So, they occupied her thoughts during 
the day. And when she mentioned them to Barney, he was sympathetic, but not too concerned. Um, and the matter, you know, was dropped. Betty didn't mention them to him again. Um, in November of 61, Betty began writing down the details of her dreams. In one dream, she and Barty encountered a roadblock and men who surrounded their car. She lost consciousness, but struggled to regain it. Then she realized that she was being forced by two small men to walk into a forest at night and of seeing Barney walking behind her. Then when she called to him, he seemed to be like in a trance or sleepwalking. Mm, okay. The men stood about five feet to five foot four inches tall and wore matching blue uniforms with caps similar to those worn by military cadets. They appeared nearly human with black hair and dark eyes, prominent noses and bluish lips. Their skin was a grayish color. Hmm. Okay. In the dreams, Betty, Barney, and the men walked up a ramp into a disc-shaped craft of metallic appearance. Once inside, Barney and Betty were separated. She protested and was told by a man, man she called the leader that if she and Barney were examined together, it would take much longer to conduct the exams. Um, she and Barney were then taken to separate rooms. Are those her drawings? These are her drawings. There? Yeah, these are her drawings that she um, drew of the craft and like what it. Okay. So what her hand. Like. Yeah. Yeah, these are her hand. Her hand drawings of um, a- after her, you know, the dreams and and you know mm-hmm. all of that. Um, so it just looks like a disc with some windows, basically. Like basic a- basically yeah like when i look at this it reminds me and you guys i'm sorry i'm not trying to make light of this but when i look at this it reminds me of the last scene um in uh empire strikes back where <laughs> han has been f- I know. <laughs> Han has been frozen in the carbonite. Lucas had his arm cut off by Vader. And they're in this like medical wing of this spacecraft. And they look outside and they're like, it's, it's windows like this. And you can like, you can, that's just sort of how the ship is shaped. It looks like this. And then they're like, they're just little figures looking out into the starry space sky. But when I saw this, I was like, this reminds me of Return, not Return of the Jedi. This reminds me of the end of Empire Strikes Back. And sorry, I mean, if anybody else knows what I'm talking about and thinks the same way, please message me because I feel kind of dumb right now. <laughs> I'm all, uh huh. Star Wars. But listen, she said NICAP a lot, and so I've kind of had a lot of drinks. So, um, All right, so back to the exam by the aliens. So mm. Benny then dreamt that a new man, similar to the others, entered to conduct her exam with the leader. Um, Betty called this new man the examiner. and <laughs> Sounds amazing. All right, sounds super good. I mean, um, this can't go bad and at said all. That he was, yeah, that said that he had a pleasant, calm manner. So at least he was nice. Sure. So So did Dr. Giggles. Remember that horror movie? (laughs) Didn't end well. So the leader and the examiner spoke to her in English. The examiner's command of language seemed imperfect, and she had difficulty understanding him. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I mean, ESL. I mean, he's trying. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they didn't offer that Mm. in space school. Right. (laughs) How many languages do you speak, buddy? I mean. (laughs) Maybe have some patience. (laughs) Um, can you imagine what that, um, (laughs) with that accent? I mean, how fucked (laughs) that accent would be. Oh my God. The language barrier is ridiculous with the (laughs) aliens. My God. Holy shit. I thought French was bad. (laughs) Right. Holy crap. Okay. (laughs) told Betty. (laughs) Um, that he would conduct a few tests to note the differences between humans and the craft's occupants. Uh, he seated her on a chair, and a bright line light was shown to her. Uh, the man cut off a lock of Betty's hair. He examined her eyes. Right. I draw the line. Uh, no, don't cut off my hair. Look at it. Take pictures. Don't cut it. Uh, he examined her eyes, ears, mouth, teeth, throat, and hands. Uh, he saved trimmings from her fingernails. I'm on this sounds like a creepy stalker. A thousand percent. I'll show mine are fake. So, right. (laughs) Um, They trim them. 
Um, <laughs> now they have locks to your hair and your fingernails. I'm just saying. I mean, kind of, um, they're creating clones. Right? After examining her legs and feet, the man used a dull knife, similar to a letter opener, to scrape some of her skin onto what resembled cellophane. He then tested her nervous system and he thrust the needle, a needle into her navel, yeah. which caused Betty agonizing pain. Where yeah. the leader waved his hand in front of her eyes and the pain vanished. Well, that's a neat trick. Yeah. I think that would mm -hmm. be handy. I mean, maybe don't put the fucking thing in there in the first place. Well, yeah, but I um, mean, like, if I have a headache, I could just be like, whoosh, 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 and then headache is gone. I feel like there's there's sure. benefits to this hand wavy pain relief thing. I agree. All right. <laughs> That'd be great. Right? I mean... Mind cap. Um, uh, cheers, The clink. examiner left the room and Betty engaged in conversation with the leader. Uh, she picked up a book with rows of strange symbols that the leader said she could take home with her. She also asked from where he came and he pulled down an instructional map dotted with stars. In Betty's dream account, the men began escorting the hills from the ship when a disagreement broke out. The leader then informed Betty that she couldn't keep the book, stating that they had decided that the other men did not want her to even remember the encounter. Uh, Betty insisted that no matter what they did to her memory, one day she would recall the events. That's right, girl. So she, right? She's like, listen. A woman never forgets. <laughs> Legit. <laughs> She's gonna hold a fucking grudge. Forever. <laughs> She's gonna tell that story and then her. we're gonna tell it. Yeah, you cut her hair. The fuck you think you are? Okay. Right. So she and Barney, you're ruining her fucking honeymoon for real. So I mean, she and Barney were right. taken to their car where the leader suggested that they wait to watch the craft's departure. They did so and then resumed their drive. You should watch our departure. It's spectacular. We've got sparklers <laughs> and there's rainbows and you should just really watch this. So on November 25th of 61, the Hills were again interviewed at length by nine cap members. Cheers. This time, C.D. Jackson and Robert E. Holman. Holman. Um, having read Webb's initial report, Jackson and Holman had many questions for the Hills. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's very the, late at night when we're recording <laughs> this, guys, just so you know. <laughs> so, um, one of their main questions was about the length of the trip. So, although the Hills had noted that they had arrived home later than anticipated, the 178-mile drive should have taken about four hours. Uh, they did not realize that they had arrived home seven hours after their departure from Colebrook. So, when Homan and Jackson noted this discrepancy to the Hills, they, the couple had no explanation. A uh, phenomenon UFOlogists call missing time. Fair. Right. I mean apt name uh, the hills claim to recall almost nothing of the 35 miles of u.s route 3 between lincoln and indian head or lincoln slash indian head in ashland uh, both claim to recall an image of a fiery orb sitting on the ground betty and barney reason that it must have been the moon but homan and jackson informed them that the moon had set earlier in the evening a fiery orb sitting on the ground and they said it must have been the moon yeah i guess so or like you know on the horizon maybe Oh, okay. As I mimed the horizon. <laughs> Out there. <laughs> For the audio listeners, she's mm. pointing to her left. <laughs> like, the moon. The moon is <laughs> over <laughs> Jesus' age. All right. So the subject of hypnosis came up, and it was decided that it should be carried out in order to recover previously irretrievable memories. Uh, Bernie was apprehensive, but thought it might help Betty put to rest what Bernie described as the nonsense about her dreams oh thanks thanks mm -hmm. husband <laughs> right so by february of 62 the hills were making frequent weekend drives to the white mountains hoping that revisiting the site might spark more memories they were unsuccessful in trying to locate the site where they recalled seeing a fiery orb sitting in the road however they were the able moon. to eliminate mm -hmm. several possible routes um, they found what they claimed was the capture site on Labor Day weekend in 65. Oh, shit. Yeah, it took them three years, that's all. I mean, of course it took them three years. They thought the moon was sitting on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, guys, sorry. 
So on November 23rd of 62, the Hills attended a meeting at the personage of their church where there was a guest speaker, Captain Ben H. Sweat of the United States Air Force. Oh, okay. So having had an interest in hypnosis, the Hills approached Sweat privately and related their strange encounter. Sweat was particularly interested in the missing time of the Hills account. But yeah, the as Hills, am I. <laughs> right, me too. So the Hills asked if they would, um, if he would hypnotize them to recover their memories. Um, but he declined and cautioned them against going to an amateur hypnotist um, such as himself. Oh, well, that's so, nice. I mean, yeah, he's there- basically saying, like, you need a fucking professional. <laughs> industrial strength mm-hmm. professional sure. hypnotist <laughs> i just dabble on the weekends with my friends right <laughs> when we play the nightcap drinking game <laughs> exactly. so on march 3rd of 63 the hills first publicly discussed the ufo encounter with um a group at their church oh okay i wonder how that went over um i do September too 7th of 63 captain sweat returned and gave a formal lecture on hypnosis to a meeting at the unitarian church after the lecture, the Hills told him that Barney was going to a psychiatrist, a Mr. Stevens, whom he liked and trusted. Captain Sweat suggested that Barney ask this Mr. Stevens about the use of hypnosis in his case. Mm, fair. So when Barney next met with Stevens, he asked about the hypnosis, and Stevens referred the Hills to Benjamin Simon of Boston. So on November 3rd, the Hills um, spoke before an amateur UFO study group the two-state UFO study group in Quincy Center, Massachusetts. So the Hills first met Simon on December 14th, um, still of 63. So early in their discussion, Simon determined that the UFO encounter was causing Barney far more worry and anxiety that he was willing to admit. Shocking. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> a man is ignoring it? Wow, that's that's really smart. <laughs> Sorry, men listening. He's not talking about his feelings? I don't understand. I don't um, I don't get it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, man. especially in the 60s. He's a World War II vet. I mean, mm, yeah. he's like, he sounds like a man's manny man. I mean, he does. Mm-hmm. So Simon dismissed the popular extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial like why I can't say that word, hypnosis <laughs> is impossible. Um, It seemed obvious to him that the Hills genuinely thought that they had witnessed a UFO with human-like occupants. Simon hoped to uncover more about the experience through hypnosis. So Simon began hypnotizing the Hills on January 1st of 64. He hypnotized Betty and Barney several times each, and the sessions lasted until June 6th of 64. That's a long time. So a solid six months. Mm -hmm. So... Simon conducted the sessions on Benny and Barney and Benny Benny separately. (laughs) I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure what I'm talking about anymore. (laughs) I'm making them like a famous couple. I'm just going to put them together. (laughs) Like Benifer. Like Benifer Kravis. Okay. Right. It's Barty. It's Barty. All right. Cool. (laughs) So they could not. um, Well, he did them separate so that they couldn't overhear the other person's recollections. Fair. I like it. And. Right, so that at the end of each session, he would reinstate the amnesia. That sounds crazy, but also almost necessary, especially if if um, the Barney part of Barty uh, was having <laughs> like anxiety and worry. Um, well, can you imagine if you can only remember par- like part of it? It'd be better to have the missing time than be scared out of your fucking mind. I mean, I don't know. I've never been like blackout drunk. I've always remembered every horrible thing that I have ever said, did or thought when I was wasted. So I, I'm assuming this is sort of like being blackout drunk and I just can't relate. Unfortunately. Um, I have heard that. <laughs> the wink, wink, part, heard. <laughs> the worst part of being blackout drunk is when your friends tell you what you did the next day. So I kind of think about that as the hypnosis. <laughs> the missing time. Yeah. Please don't. I don't want to remember this. You pissed in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> like you might not want to know. Right. <laughs> I'm recording that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you forget it anyway. Still, it's fine. But it's here in my notes <laughs> when I publish my book about you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Holy shit. Holy crap. All right. Well, we're coming to my part of the story, guys, and we will be right back as soon as I refill 
my wine glass because I do say NICAP a few more times <laughs> in the last half of our story. We will be right back after this blip of time. Okay, so Barney's sessions. So Simon hypnotized Barney first, and his recall of witnessing non-human figures was quite emotional and punctuated with expressions of fear, emotional outbursts, and incredulity. So Barney said that due to his fear, he had kept his eyes closed for much of the abduction and physical examination, and quite frankly, I don't blame him. Um, Based on these early responses, Simon told Barney that he could not know. Simon told Barney that he would not remember the hypnosis sessions until he was certain he could remember them without being further traumatized, which, sure, I mean. Sounds right. It sounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So far, solid plan. Mm -hmm. Um, Under hypnosis, as was consistent with his conscious recall, Barney reported that the binocular strap had broken when he ran from the UFO back to his car. He recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but that afterwards he felt irresistibly compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods. He eventually sighted six men standing in the dirt road. The car stalled and three of the men approached the car. They told Barney not to fear them, but he was still anxious and he reported that the leader told Barney to close his eyes. While hypnotized, Barney said, quote, I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes. I can't even begin to... That just... Yeah. Mm-mm. That sounds gross. I don't yeah. Know. You know how, like, you, like, meet somebody and they're, like, their their gaze and they're just looking at you is so penetrating that you actually feel like they're, like, staring into your soul? Maybe that's what that felt felt like. You're like, no, I don't know that either, yeah. Carrie. <laughs> You're like, meh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Barney described the beings as being generally similar to Betty's hypnotic, not dream recollection. So remember, she had those dreams for five nights. So this was Mm -hmm. different than her hypnotic recollection was different from her dream recollection. And he described them as being generally similar to her hypnotic recollection. So the beings often stared into his eyes and they kind of had this terrifying mesmerizing effect under hypnosis. Barney said things like, Oh, those eyes they're they're in, they're there in my brain. And that was from his first hypnosis session. He also said, I was told to close my eyes because I saw two eyes coming close to mine. And I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes again. I don't know if I'll ever get that out of my head. I don't know. I don't know. Um, That he said in his second hypnosis session. Um, He also said, all I see are these eyes. I'm not even afraid that they're not connected to a body. What the fuck is going on with these eyes? I I mean, (laughs) Jesus. Um, They're just there. They're just up close to me, pressing against my eyes. Oh, my God. I have a thing with eyes and brains. It's like I tap out. I mean, like I can deal with blood. I can deal with <laughs> organs and stuff like that. Except for the eyes and the brain, I'm like, mm, I'm done. no, no, yeah, um, yeah. So they putting eyes can... on your eyes. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Do not touch my eyes with your eyes. I will kill you. <laughs> That's too much for my brain. <laughs> Just for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like contacts in my eyes. Um, <laughs> Barney related that he and Betty were taken onto the disc-shaped craft when they were separated. He was escorted to a room by three of the men and told to lie on a small rectangular exam table. So Barney's narrative for the event was, or the exam rather, was fragmented. He continued to keep his eyes closed for most of the exam. There was this cup-like device placed over his genitals. He said that he did not experience an orgasm, though he thought that a sperm sample had been taken. The men scraped his skin and peered into his eyes and mouth. Now, I'm wondering if there was eyes on eyes peering and mouth on mouth. Or I'm not really, like, now I'm like, what is happening with these body parts? Um, right? Now it yeah. just sounds like people are making out. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really drunk night like this one night. Mm-hmm. Kidding, <laughs> guys. I it's it's just creepy, and so I'm trying eyes to make jokes. Eyes. It's ner- it's yeah, and Laura and that whole eyes on eyes thing is stop it. <laughs> so 
A tube or a cylinder was inserted into his anus and quickly removed. Someone felt his spine and seemed to be counting his vertebrae. Mm, Don't love that either. Leave my spine alone. Right? I can show you a picture book. I I swear I have just as many as the drawing does. Like, don't. Spine, that's my weird thing. Don't. You're like, no. Like, your entire nervous system, like, and your entire nervous system runs through your spine. Don't. mm, 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 Nope, 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 nope. So, while Betty reported a conversation with the leader in English, Barney said that he heard them speaking in a mumbling language he did not understand. But he also mentioned this detail. The few times they communicated with him, Barney said it seemed to be thought transference. So at the time, he was unfamiliar with the word telepathy. Both Barney and Betty stated that they hadn't observed the being's mouths moving when they communicated in English with them, which is a detail that I found really interesting because, tiny sidebar, when you have a visitation dream, wherein a dead friend or family member comes to visit you in your dream, very similar to the dream that I had of my grandmother. Um, It's often reported that in a visitation dream, wherein you know it is a dream, and you know that it is your deceased friend or family member or loved one visiting you in the dream, it's often reported that their lips don't move. You're talking to them, as a normal conversation, but their lips are not moving. And the the idea behind it is that they're pure energy. They have no need, their spirit, right? They have no need mm-hmm. for um, a physical body. They're appearing to you in your dream in their physical body, but essentially their spirit is just pure energy and they don't actually need to go through the motions of physical speech. So I thought it was really fascinating that they both stated that they hadn't observed the being's mouths moving when they communicated in English with them. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, Barney did recall being escorted from the ship and taken to his car. In a Mm. daze, he watched the ship leave. Barney also remembered a light appearing on the road, and he said, oh, no, not again, which I probably would be the same. (laughs) Oh, crap. I'd be like, we need to get the fuck up out of here. Why are we still here? (laughs) Right? Um, Coming back. Yeah. He recalled Betty's speculation that the light might have been the moon, though the moon had set several hours earlier, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. He also stated that he attempted to produce the code-like buzzing sounds, which seemed to strike the car's trunk a second time by driving from side to side to side. Too many nightcaps. Um, (laughs) The car's (laughs) trunk. He tried to reproduce the code-like buzzing sounds, which seemed to strike the car's trunk a second time by driving from side to side and stopping and starting the vehicle. But his attempt was unsuccessful. So those were his hypnosis sessions and what he was able to recollect through Mm them. Betty's. So under hypnosis, her account was similar to her five dreams about the UFO abduction with some notable differences, mainly pertaining to her capture and release. So also the technology on the craft was different. The short men differed significantly in physical appearance and the sequential order of the abduction differed between her hypnosis sessions and her dreams. So Barney's and Betty's memories in hypnotic regression were, however, consistent with one another. And remember, guys, Laura said he conducted these sessions separately of each other. He didn't do them at the same time so that they were not cognizant of what the other was saying in these states. So that's worth mentioning, I think. So, <clears throat> Betty exhibited considerable emotional distress when recounting her capture and examination. I would, too, if they poked a needle into my belly button. I wouldn't love talking about that either. Um, Simon ended one session early because tears were flowing down her cheeks when she was talking about it. Aww. I know, right? 
Simon um, gave Betty the post hypnotic suggestion that she could sketch a copy of the star map she later described as a three dimensional projection similar to a hologram. And through the map, she saw uh, through the map that she saw, it had many stars. So she drew only those that stood out in her memory. And her map consisted of 12 prominent stars connected by lines and three lesser ones that formed a distinctive triangle. She said she was told the stars connected by solid lines formed trade routes, whereas the dashed lines were to less traveled stars. This is very detailed. You know what I mean? This is very yeah, is. detailed. So after Betty's examination ended, the beings rushed back into her room excited. Apparently, they had discovered that Barney's teeth could be removed. And Betty laughed, explaining that Barney had dentures, a fact of human aging that the beings struggled to understand. I thought I found that so amusing. <laughs> <laughs> that they were like, That's oh my so god, funny. this one's teeth come out. <laughs> they, they, this, these teeth come out. I thought that was really amusing. Um, right, that is funny. Right. So later, alone with the leader, Betty asked where the craft had flown, admitting she knew little of the universe. The being joked with her, saying, if you don't know where you are, there wouldn't be any point in telling you where I am. Later, under hypnosis, she drew this star map shown to her on the ship. So this Simon, this therapist, this hypnotist guy, his conclusions were that after the hypnosis sessions, he speculated that Barney's recollection of the UFO encounter was possibly a fantasy inspired by Betty's dreams. Simon thought that it was the most reasonable and consistent explanation. Now, Barney rejected this idea, noting that while their memories were consistent in some regards, there were also portions of both of their narratives that were unique to each of them. Barney was now ready to accept the fact that they had been abducted by the occupants of a UFO, though he never really embraced it as fully as Betty did. Mm -hmm. So, through the hills or though the Hills, rather, and Simon disagreed about the cause of their distress, they all concurred that the hypnosis sessions were actually very effective. The Hills were no longer tormented by abduction anxiety. Now, when the series of sessions were complete, this guy wrote an article about the Hills for the journal Psychiatric Opinion, explaining his conclusion that the case was a singular psychological aberration. Okay. At least they had their answers, and there's that on that. Right. So, <clears throat> after the hy hypnosis sessions, the Hills went back to their regular lives. They were willing to discuss the alleged UFO encounter with friends, family, and the occasional UFO researcher, but the Hills apparently made no effort to seek publicity. However, on October 25th, 1965... A front page story in the Boston Traveler asked the question, quote, UFO chiller, did they seize couple? So reporter John H. Luttrell of the Traveler had allegedly been given an audio tape recording of the lecture the Hills had made in Quincy Center in late 1963, two years, two years prior. Um, Luttrell learned that the Hills had undergone hypnosis with Simon, and he also obtained notes from confidential interviews the Hills had given to UFO investigators. On October 26, United Press International picked up Luttrell's story, and the Hills earned international attention. So, in 1960... That seems real fucked up, though. Right, uh, like, massively fucked up. But, at the same time, like... The stuff that, that he got, like, it was all, like, they did this. They did speak on this. They did, right. you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like that he had somehow, like, unscrupulously gotten, you know, their hypnotherapist notes or, you know. So it is fucked yeah, up, I mean, but at the same like time, it's like, it was, yeah. yeah. So in 1966, writer John G. Fuller secured the cooperation of the Hills and of Simon and wrote the book, The Interrupted Journey, uh, which was about the case. 
And the book included a copy of Betty's sketch of the star map, which I failed to include in all of my pictures. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but we'll add it to the social media pictures, I promise. Um, the book was a quick success and went through several printings. Now, Barney died of a cerebral hemorrhage on February 25th, 1969, at age just 46. So... Oh, that's so young. Mm -hmm, a year, less than a year older than me. Um, after which Betty went on to become a celebrity in the UFO community. She died of cancer on October 17th, 2004, at the age of 85, never having remarried. Um, now... That's essentially the story of Barney and Betty Hill. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, what their story, because they're essentially, they're one of the first alien abduction stories to come out. And I, I feel like, and this is where I start to talk about Travis Walton again. I feel like they were, um, their story and how brave they were in telling it in, you know, going through all of the worldwide international, um, you know, popularity and, and you know, people were fascinated mm -hmm. by them. I feel like they kind of paved that way for him to feel comfortable enough to be like, hey, this happened to me, too. So <clears throat> psychiatrists later suggested that the supposed abduction was a hallucination brought on by the stress of being an interracial couple in the early 1960s United States. Um, uh, is what I say. But Betty discounted this suggestion, noting her relationship with Barney was happy and their interracial marriage caused no notable problems with their friends or family. And as noted in The Interrupted Journey, that book, Simon thought that the Hill's marital status had nothing to do with the UFO encounter. So there was a man named right. Jim McDonald who was a resident of the area in which the Hills claimed to have been abducted. And he has produced a detailed analysis of their journey, which concludes that the episode was provoked by their misperceiving an aircraft warning beacon on Cannon Mountain as a UFO. So McDonald notes that from the road the Hills took, the beacon appears and disappears at exactly the same time the hills describe the UFO as appearing and disappearing. The remainder of the experience is ascribed to stress, sleep deprivation, and false memories recovered, air quote, under hypnosis. So after reading McDonald's recreation, UFO expert Robert Schaefer wrote that the hills are the poster children for not driving when sleep deprived, which I think is just disgusting. His article... And he's a UFO expert, eh? Right. Exactly. Because there's such a thing. Uh, yes. Go on. So, <laughs> McDonald's article focuses primarily on the Hill's observations of the light in the sky and the timing of the journey, discounting the Hill's accounts of close encounters south of Cannon Mountain as recovered memories. So... Skeptical Inquirer columnist Robert Schaefer wrote, quote, I was present at the National UFO Conference in New York City in 1980, at which Betty presented some of the UFO photos she had taken. She showed what must have been far more than 200 slides, mostly of blips, blurs, and blobs against a dark background. These were supposed to be UFOs coming in close, chasing her car, landing, etc., after her talk had exceeded about twice its allotted time, Betty was literally jeered off the stage by what had been, at first, a sympathetic audience. This incident, witnessed by many of ufology's leaders and top activists, removed any, any, nope, removed any lingering <laughs> doubts about Betty's credibility. She had none. In 1995, Betty Hill wrote a self-published book, titled A Common Sense Approach to UFOs. It is filled with delusional stories, such as seeing entire squadrons of UFOs in flight and a truck levitating above the freeway. This guy well, eviscerated I'm gonna her. I'm going to interject right here because... Yeah. The, I mean, if you... The lights over Phoenix? Mm-hmm. That have never been... I remember that. I don't believe... Um, I remember that. Um, 
Did we ever get an official anything on that? I don't think no, so. No, I mean, I think, like, at the time they were saying it was, like, training exercises from either Gila Bend or Luke Air Force Base, but they never... But that was... Nobody that believed was, that. that was, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, okay. I'm just, like, because there... I mean, there's been similar stuff here. I mean, that I even saw, like... Were you here for that? Did you? I I was here for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was in '97. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Um, Is that that long ago? Jesus Christ, I'm old. All right, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Sorry, I, it was last year. I missed it. I had already moved All right, here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it was like four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean. You didn't ask control. when that it was happened. In the 1900s. That was back in the 1900s. Back in the 1900s. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, <laughs> so Schaefer later wrote that as late as 1977, Betty Hill, <clears throat> excuse me, Betty Hill would go on UFO vigils at least three times a week. One evening, she was joined by UFO enthusiast John Oswald. When asked about Betty's continuing UFO observations, Oswald stated, quote, she is not really seeing UFOs, but she is calling them that. On the night they went out together, he said, quote, Mrs. Hill was unable to distinguish between a landed UFO and a street light. In a later interview, Schaefer recounts that Betty Hill wrote, UFOs are a new science and our science cannot explain them. Again, just trashing this woman. So <clears throat> Robert Schaefer released 48 pages of archived, do archived documents relating to Betty and Barney Hill, Benjamin Simon, and Philip J. Kloss on the internet on December 23rd, 2015. So <clears throat> that's kind of like where the story is today. Um, now, this couple um, is, as far as like in popular culture, Barney Hill was actually on an episode of To Tell the Truth. The episode um, aired December 12, 1966. The couple was also That's portrayed. So cool. Right? <clears throat> and I think, was mm -hmm. that. Um, that was a cool show back then. Wasn't that day. Leonard Nimoy's show? Was that him? I don't remember. To who, Tell the Truth? I don't I don't remember who was hosting it, but I, like, I, I know, I'm, like, I've only seen clips mostly yeah. of, like, different people on there. But Yeah. Because I wasn't obviously not alive then, but. <laughs> Are you sure it was the 1900s? <laughs> yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> so the couple was also <laughs> portrayed by James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons in the 1975 television film adapted by S. Lee Pogostin, The UFO Incident, and by Basil Wallace and Lee Garlington in the 1996 television series Dark Skies. I never saw any of these things. But yeah, it sounds fascinating. Either. Okay. Um, in 2018, the story formed the basis of the Dinner Party virtual reality exhibit at the traveling art show Wonder Spaces. Oh, that's kind of cool. I did. I, I have seen Wonder Spaces. Like, that was, that came to Phoenix mm -hmm. for a while. And we were going to get tickets. And then it was a COVID thing. And it was all kind of crazy. But. Um, Barney and Betty Hill have been the topic of many podcasts over the years, um, including this one. Uh, <laughs> Nonfiction television programs that have discussed their encounter include the 12th episode of Carl Sagan's miniseries Cosmos, Encyclopedia Galactica, and an episode of the Travel Channel series Mysteries at the Museum, which I love that show. That's one of my favorite shows. That is a cool show. It's really cool. Fictional depictions mm -hmm. of the couple include details of the Hills case were used in the X-Files episode, Jose Chung's From Outer Space. Uh, also in the graphic, graphic, no, graphic novel Saucer mm -hmm. Country by Paul Cornell. Elements of the Hill abduction were used in the American Horror Story Seasons Asylum and Death Valley. Uh, the ninth project, um, the ninth episode, sorry, of the 2019 History Channel television series project blue book blue book nope blue book entitled you're on a roll i mean there was too a lot nightcap. there was way too many nightcaps <laughs> there's a lot of nightcap <laughs> lots of nightcaps um the ninth episode of the 2019 history channel television series project blue book entitled abduction 
is based on the Betty and Barney Hill UFO incident. The song Bug in the Net, the 10th track on the Swedish death metal band Hypocrisy's 2021 (laughs) album Worship centers on the Hills abduction story. But I included that simply because a Swedish death metal band is like writing songs about this couple from America in the 60s that, you know, I just the reach of the story. That was really, was really crazy. Mm -hmm. So experts of all stripes have tried to explain why intelligent, otherwise mentally stable people come forward with these experiences. Many psychologists say sleep paralysis and hallucinations played a role. Leading questions during, well, hang on. Leading questions during hypnosis. The main way most abductees unlock their stories could also have been a factor. And that's a fair thing to that's a fair thing however abductee stories depend on first-hand accounts the most vulnerable form of evidence memories can be distorted by stress or distraction or even manufactured when a false memory is in place psychologists say the brain works to fill in the details like we were just like we talked about talking about yes psychologist michael Shermer points to Patternicity, the tendency to see patterns even when none exist, uh, helping us to see faces in clouds or assume that one event caused another. We in the paranormal community call that pareidolia, (laughs) just so you know. (laughs) Um, Past experience also shapes human perception. Barney was a World War II vet, um, and he thought that the the head gray, the alien gray, that's what he called it, the head mm-hmm. gray, looked like Hitler and seemed menacing. Betty, meanwhile, who had been excited to see the aliens, bantered with the affable gray who performed her medical examination. That alien even agreed to give her a book to bring to Earth with her, she said, though other crew members would later overrule that decision. In this way, alien abduction and encounter stories have helped psychologists understand the human brain, its defects, and the weaknesses inherent in memory and firsthand accounts, according to Christopher French, who is a psychologist specializing in human experience related to the paranormal. What we see and hear, especially under less than ideal observational conditions, can be heavily influenced by our prior beliefs and expectations. Now, NICAP's scientific advisor, cheers, Clink. <laughs> One last tip to the NICAP. NICAP. So their scientific advisor, <clears throat> excuse me, cross-examined the couple and found their account credible. The Air Force Project's Blue Book would ultimately dismiss the story, determining that the unexplained craft could be explained by natural causes, hinting that the couple hadn't seen a spacecraft, but only the planet Jupiter. For his part, psychiatrist Simon never felt the Hills had made up their story. He concluded that Betty had dreamed the abduction, um, had dreamed about the abduction, and Barney had absorbed her story, especially since many of the most vivid details matched description of dreams Betty had jotted down after the event. He said, I believe implicitly in the honesty of these people. Now, There is another explanation that is always possible. And that is that the abduction actually occurred. The Hills stuck by their story despite years of skeptics and detractors. Like many abductees, the couple never felt false memory or sleep paralysis explained what they had experienced. Betty became a known voice in UFO research and claimed she was visited multiple times in the decades to follow. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Barney and Betty Hill. So, um, So, what do you think? Where do you fall on this? I believe them. I absolutely believe them because I really, I have always found it, um, and I I was thinking about this when I wrote the script, when I got to that end part, I, um, they never once changed their story. The details never changed um granted he died what a handful of years after the um the abduction and she lived until the early 2000s but they never once changed their story they never and she became completely um enthralled by it she believed in it she 
believed in the memories that hypnotherapy provided her. And she made it her life's work to study as much as she possibly could about them. And I, I do believe it. I think there was a line in um, this last paragraph that I read was that despite years of skeptics and detractors, they stuck by their story and they never felt like false memory or sleep paralysis explained what they experienced. And I, I think that's the line that made me realize that I do believe their story because it is such an affront and an insult to somebody when you say to them, thank you for telling me this story about your experience. Obviously, you're crazy. Nothing like this could ever <laughs> possibly happen. I think that is such a, the, one of the biggest insults that we can give to another member of the human race is to question somebody's mind and their mental state and who do we think we are unless they're actually like going around saying hey uh you know this little green frog said i should cut open a cat and wear it like a hat then maybe you need to seek help but for something like this because it's just beyond your scope of knowledge or capability of believing that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. that doesn't happen and i just think that like stories like travis walton and all of these other subsequent stories that have come out are are very similar to this and i don't think that they're just blatantly stealing bits and pieces for their own stories i think i really believe in it i really do believe in it and i think we as a race of intelligent people are seriously ignorant if we believe we are the only beings out there i think that's yeah ignorant and I arrogant believe in, super yeah, arrogant i 100 yeah. believe in ufos and aliens yeah um yeah and i think it's terrible to just dismiss somebody's mm -hmm. um experience when they share it with you it's just it's a respect thing um, for sure yeah. even though i'm i'm a skeptic but you never hear me like going like no that's bullshit <laughs> no you never do you always I mean, approach everything with an open mind which i think um which i think is is beneficial for you and for the people like me like you're that you're interacting with and having this conversation and dialogue with um yeah we've made a lot of jokes throughout this episode but it's a very serious topic and i just think right. um yeah like it, it, <clears throat> I think if you want to learn about something, even if it's just as simple as somebody's human experience and you don't believe in the the, the UFOs or yeah. whatever that part of it, like if you can't follow <laughs> yeah. along with that and you're like, okay, that part I'm like, I can't relate to or, you know, maybe I believe is bullshit, but yeah. there's something causing that. There's some sort, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even if that's what you relate it to, right? And you're not thinking it's UFOs, you're thinking... Maybe it is the stress of an interracial marriage in the 60s. Like, well, what? Wh why would they have ended up like that? Why would they have had to pull over and rat? You know what I mean? Like, why would that have been like Why that? would that so, have been? Yeah, why would that have been the cause? And why would this be the story right. they came up with? Well, yeah. I mean, but he, like I said, if you if you don't believe in that, then okay, what are the other factors? What's happening? Mm -hmm. um, I do. I, I, do um, I do have a tendency to believe their story. Mm -hmm. Um because it was sure. so much the first of its kind, really, yeah. in a lot of ways. And again, like you said, so many of the fo the ones to follow, follow along a lot of this one. Yeah. And I don't think, I know that it was popular in the 60s, but so many people like our age and stuff don't know the story. They yeah. don't know. And we're in our 40s, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. if we don't really know the story... Like, do you think Travis Walton knew this? Do you think, you know, he's a logger. I mean, how much do you think he knew about it? Like, or a bunch of other right. people, like, following this. Like, how much do you think that they know? Right, it's exactly. Not to say that, exactly. That everybody it's, is getting yes, their information from this. Right. right. And isn't it kind of funny how all of a sudden now the government is putting out reports like, okay, there was this thing. Okay, you know, maybe there's something to the, you know. Um, mm -hmm. 
It, it, well, the government has the videos mm-hmm. taken from Navy pilots. They have yeah. all kinds of stuff. Um, and granted, they were looking into it more as they were worried about, like, an enemy of the United States having better capabilities. But they were looking at UFOs trying to figure out what the fuck they were, and they couldn't figure it out. So, Yeah. Yeah, and there's just been too many, like, sightings all over the world, crop circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of weirdness that um, just can't be explained. And not everything is fucking ghosts. Sometimes it's the galactic family. I believe it. (laughs) And sometimes it's two foes. Sometimes it's two foes. I mean, if it's not a ghost, it's probably an alien. It's probably an alien. Yeah. Um, and we, the, us as human beings, earthlings are fucking it all up. So they're all coming together and they're like, listen, guys, you need to get your shit together. Um, or we're going to be coming back for a lot more of you because <laughs> you're really de- <laughs> kind of fucking dumb. Um, so yeah, I believe them. You believe them? It sounds like you believe them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah. I err towards that side. Yeah, yeah, you do. I think you were the more into UFOs than I was. Um, yeah, but you're catching um, up though. I am. <laughs> I'm catching up. I am catch. I'm getting a crash course, and uh, uh, yeah, I like it. I'm I'm here for it. I I think it's it's great. And also, NICAP, here's to you. Right, NICAP, mm-hmm. you're my favorite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A thousand percent. Um, So that's it, guys. That is our show. We do not have any um, strange history, simply because this was strange enough as it is. So, (laughs) Laura, why don't you tell everybody where they can follow us, uh, should they choose to do so, and I highly recommend they do. You really, really should follow us maybe if my us. button isn't working hold on i gotta click it because the button doesn't work <laughs> there we go you can follow us on instagram facebook and twitter at hoh podcast and on the tiktok at oh that button works hoh podcast at <laughs> hoh gary and at hoh co-host laura yay and yeah thanks guys for watching we love you we appreciate thanks. you um we hope you enjoyed it and we certainly did this is a really great story next week we have a brand new episode to bring you we swear to god we're not going to default to re-release this <laughs> I, I promise um the episode escapes me but it's gonna be brand new to that end we want to say as we always do here at history of a haunting podcast number one trans allegheny recap is coming up number two come see us at spirit con in st augustine florida next year number three we're gonna write a book please buy it and number four stay safe out there because you never know who (laughs) or what (laughs) is listening (laughs) is listening bye guys thanks guys (laughs)